Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hey, folks. Thanks for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. It's bright and early here in Vancouver, 8 a.m. Yeah. <clears throat> 8 a.m. here, too, in California. <clears throat> Where is everyone else joining us from? Rhode Island, nice. Hey, Lena, Bilal, John, thanks for joining us. Toronto, UK, wow, we have folks from all over the world, Vietnam, France, Sweden, love it. No pressure, Sam. <laughs> Great to see everyone coming in. Netherlands, Vietnam. welcome, Marco. Ooh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. It's late over there. Thanks for joining us so late. Hopefully, we're engaging, and you know we don't put you to sleep. That'd be <laughs> important. <laughs> okay, I think. Uh, so we're a couple minutes after the hour, so uh, I think we can. Uh, I think we can get started. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we we have an exciting webinar today. I think there's like three sections, um, and we're we've got uh, we're going to walk through the. So on Tuesday, the um, on Tuesday we talked through some of the uh, technical aspects of the architecture uh, of a uh, of a modular web project. Um, you know, go catch the webinar. There's a link on the, the website if you, you have it there. Um, you know, maybe after that, that if you're interested. This is going to be focusing more on the people aspect and the people side of things. Uh, so we're going to start off um, with Neha kind of like walking through some of the kind of key players that you often see in, and that we've seen sort of through hundreds of uh, modular web projects. Then I'm going to go and kind of dive more into the organization types. And then we're going to kind of close out with talking about how you assess risks um, on a on a modular web project, and and a lot of the materials kind of coming from um, this this book, uh, modular the web's new architecture that I wrote. But really, that book is a summary of the experience that we've had chatting with dozens and hundreds of uh, teams building you know all sorts of modular web projects with Gatsby, with headless CMSs, um, on Jamstack hosting platforms, and so on. So. Um, our kind of assumption here is that you're uh, is that you're in, involved in 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 a project, or maybe you will be involved soon. And so our our hope is that you'll see some lessons for you that you're going to take away to your project. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's dig in and let's get started. Awesome, thanks, Sam. And hello, everyone. My name is Neha Varshne. I am Gatsby's director of product marketing. I'm really excited to introduce you first and foremost to three of my really good friends. So we have three of my friends right over here. We have David, the developer enthusiast. We have Abigail, the agency owner, and we have Adam, the architect. And I wanna first introduce you to my friend, David. David, as you know, he's your inquisitive 31 year old developer that gets super pumped about any new tool and technology. He's the one that's usually keen to experiment with them, play around with them, and he's always trying to find a better way of doing things. And when he does, David is your guy. He becomes the biggest spokesperson for it. And even when David learned React in his career, he actually never went back. He ended up leading a successful Jamstack technology transition at his last job as a web developer. And there have even been murmurs from his current colleagues that he could probably do the same here since he's technically capable and other developers respect him. So like I mentioned, my friend David, he's always experimenting with something. So even at home, you'll usually catch him experimenting with a home brewing rig. But something you got to know about my friend David, he absolutely hates being stuck in traffic. He's a little bit impatient, and that's probably why. Mm -hmm. 
So now I want you to meet our good friend, Abigail. She's 37 and she's absolutely killing it. She's built her agency by leveraging all of her personal connections and brand that she's made over the years. And she's done a lot in her career to date. So whether that's project management or consulting, she knows her stuff inside and out because you know why she's worked with so many different types of people over the years that she can actually very quickly identify if a prospective client is going to be a good match for her agency or not. That's a pretty big skill to have. Um, Abigail truly wants to ensure her clients view her as an equal partner and not just a pure implementer. Uh, on the weekends, you'll catch Abigail doing what you'll often catch me doing, visiting the latest restaurant in the city with friends and trying to snap the latest Instagram worthy shot. Um, you'll also find her usually going the extra mile for those that maybe not appreciate it in return. And last but not least, I want to introduce you to Adam. Uh, Adam's your 46-year-old, highly experienced IT professional that knows all the nitty-gritty about the current website stack and development process. They've actually helped build it piece by piece over the last three or four years in their organization, but something at the back of their mind is nagging them that, you know what, it's probably time to make another change. However, Adam ain't messing around. Um, since he is part of a larger company and a larger player in the field, he's only willing to consider solutions that have proven themselves successful um, in working with other companies of their size. He's worked extremely hard to get to where he is in their career, so he's really constantly going to question if any potential solution will actually uphold their standards. They really need to be reassured and shown case studies of previous successful projects to truly earn their trust. On the weekends, you'll catch Adam taking his kids to a science exhibit, and something that he's not a fan of are rules that just don't make sense. So why am I telling you about three of my friends? Well, these, um, whether it's David or Abigail or Adam, these are typically the trailblazers that you see in the modular web. They're the ones that folks identify with. So I wanna take a quick minute and ask, which one do you identify with? Pop it into the chat. I'm just curious to know um, who you resonate with the most. Emmanuel, David, the developer enthusiast, love it. Anyone else? Roger, Dave, that talks with a lot of Adams. Paul is an Adam. Antonia, probably David. Adam, the architect. I'm impatient too. Me too, Antonia. <laughs> uh, Marco, Abigail, love it. John, is all of the above an answer? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> For participating folks. Um, that was fun. So once you know who you are, it's important to identify who the others are in your organization. So if you're a David, who's the Abigail? Are you working with another agency? Can you be working with an agency? Who's the Adam in your, your organization that you're going to truly have to get buy-in from to move things forward? So is there anyone in your organization that's a Abigail or Adam or a David? If you're not, let me know. Cool. So, you know, if you've identified who you are and you know who the others are in, within the organization, the biggest takeaway is that you have to really leverage the other personas in your organization to help build momentum for your project. It's hard to do it alone. You need other folks that get the vision and want to move things forward just the same as you do. Um, so great. I think that was a super fun um thing to go through. And I think, you know, sometimes we identify with one of them, sometimes we identify with multiple, but, you know, it, it often takes a team to, to bring change and move things forward. So, you know, one of the, <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to be, that, you know, we're talking a lot about today is just how do you, how does that process of change work? Right. And so that was the people side of things, thinking about 
the different types of folks and all their different rationales of, of and what they need to be persuaded to get them on board with you know the the project or projects that are moving you forward into the modular web world into the Jamstack into Gatsby into headless CMSs wherever kind of like wherever you're um, wherever you're going uh, here. I'm going to now sort of shift over and talk a little bit about uh, three types of organizations and uh, and sort of like this facet of the journey because different types of organizations have really different journeys and different sort of internal narratives and stories. And one of the things that can be useful um, as you're building consensus and like building momentum for the modular web inside your organization is uh, is really leveraging the stories that people are telling about the journey that the organization is on. Um, so uh, so as we've you know talked to just a number of organizations, we kind of found that they really fell into three main categories of organization. You know, we, we kind of called them by these, these names, um, the butterfly, the eagle, and the phoenix. And we'll, we'll be walking through each one of them and just talking about them. Again, same same sort of thing as, you're, as we're talking through these, just think about like, does this sound like my organization um, as we're going through? So the, the butterfly is an organization that's really kind of going through this gradual kind of like transformation process. You can think about a, caterp a caterpillar sort of molting and shutting its cocoon turning into a uh, turning into a butterfly and so you know this kind of organization had had a you know cms stack and you know it worked pretty well a while ago but as they're just launching more and more digital projects it just isn't working as well and so they're kind of they're they're they're, they're really moving on to the the jam stack or gatsby or the modular web to help enable kind of this agility of being able to like launch projects um, pretty quickly um, and and you know there's obviously a number of organizations that that kind of inspired this, but one that kind of sticks out to my mind is this large CPG company. Um, you know they've kind of launched hundreds of projects in the last two three years, and that was really enabled by their you know by their new kind of tech stack with the headless CMS behind it, and kind of Gatsby as the framework, Gatsby Cloud as the hosting, and and they really you know they as they shifted to this new stack, they it was kind of a gradual process over time, but they really started seeing the agility benefits of. Uh, of the uh, of their new modular stack, um, so the uh, you know the eagle is um, we, we we see a lot of these organizations that are kind of scanning for growth opportunities. They're very conversion driven, ROI driven, metrics driven. They think about numbers a lot. They are their demand generation arm is very strong. They're they're really trying to figure out um, how do we turn you know visitors into leads into revenue. Um, and they spend a lot of time there, a lot of their organizational like mind is in that space. And so these these folks often found um, Gatsby, the Jamstack, the modular web through um, just kind of experimenting. Like someone was like, what if we tried doing this? And, you know, one organization that kind of sticks out was this uh, global education company. And they built a landing page with Gatsby. It converted at double the uh, normal rate. And then they were like, OK, we can just kind of really go site by site across this like very big very sort of wide um set of uh, uh set of uh websites that they had and just kind of one by one they started moving them over to you know gatsby plus content stack um a uh, stack uh and um and you know this kind of organization you know they they they're very results oriented um they're very con you know again they're very conversion focused uh and they really get driven by the bottom line um, and, and they want to tie things to the bottom line. Um, and then the, the last organization that we'll talk about is what we call the Phoenix. Um, this, this might be a little bit of a, uh, sometimes this is often a little bit of a smaller organization. Um, they're really thinking about their image, their brand, um, or it could be something that's like in fashion or another very uh, like brand intensive like industry, right? Um, and and what they're really trying to accomplish with the modular web is they just they want to refresh their look. They're they've made a big change in their company and like the kind of the capstone of their maybe CMO's new rebranding is the new website. And once they launch a new website, this rebranding will be complete. And so they really they they're you know changing their look and feel and they're they're more image design looks driven. Um, and they really feel that if they shake things up, it's going to be um, a big monument kind of for, for part of their company's journey. 
So there's a Series B startup um, that comes to mind. Um, they were launching this kind of like multi-cloud tool. And as part of that, they 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 redid their their website and sort of like their whole look and feel just changed. Um, so again, there's, you know, there's more kinds of, there, there's some companies are gonna fall under multiple categories. You know, most companies that we see, you can kind of associate them with one or the other of, of these three, uh, of these three journeys. Uh, but, you know, I, I want you to kind of, um, to maybe in the chat, you can, we'll take 30 seconds or a minute and you can say what type of organization, you know, you, you work with um, or you either at an agency or what type of organization you're part of. And seeing Roger here saying it's a textbook eagle. Thank you, by the way, if, if, if you're saying this is a textbook, I, I appreciate that. I take that as a compliment. Uh, we've got a couple eagles here, a couple more eagles. Phoenix, okay. Thanks, Stacy. Oh, that's really interesting. Antonia, um, Antonia Phoenix um, uh, for her online store, but also CMS driven uh, butterfly sites. And, and thanks, Antonia, for, you know, it was great to see you uh, on Tuesday and great to have you back here today. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, Great, I'll wait another five seconds or so and then um, keep going on. Okay, so so one of the takeaways um, is that when you understand, you know, what journey your organization is on, um, it's really important to frame the conversations that you have in terms of that journey, right? As an organization, you know, business and exec leaders have a sense that there's a story that we're kind of like all writing together. And if they feel like you're on the same page with that story, then they're going to listen to you a lot more than if they feel like maybe they're on a different page and, and you know, they're going to feel like they need to bring you back to the story that everybody's on. But if you, you can kind of show them that you're on that, you know, you're on that journey, you're on the same page as they are about the story that, you know, the organization and everybody inside it is trying to write together, then there's there's a lot more. Um, there, there's a lot more leverage there, um, and you know, I think that a lot of the advice often given as you know, developers that become tech leads or engineering managers or just otherwise assume kind of like leadership roles in their orgs, um, or who are working, you know, as an agency partner, right? Is that uh, it's important to emphasize business benefits, but but I'd actually go one step further, and we kind of go one step further, which is that the type of business benefit you want to really emphasize and harp on is very much driven by the kind of organization you're you're part of, right? And you know, as we're kind of talking through all the things, it's like, well, do you emphasize agility or like ROI conversion, design brand? It really depends what kind of organization you're part of, right? And so framing it, that conversation in the right way, there's no right one. There's no one best way to advocate for the modular web, right? Or uh, but the the right way for your organization is going to be really driven by the kind of organization that you're part of. Um, okay, so, cool. So, yeah. Oh, go for it, Sam. No, no, sorry, you go for it. <laughs> so when it comes to risk mitigation, what can you do to do your part? Well, we've thought of a little something that we'll run you through. And so, so this is the... Um, so this is the modular web readiness um, rubric that we uh, we put together in, um, in in this book, and so we've kind of pulled it out here. Um, one of the kind of the key questions to ask, you know, we've we've talked about right the people side of things, we've talked about um, the organizational journey side of things, but there's also like an organizational maturity side of things, which is great. Like, how far are you into this process? How far are you into this journey? Um, and you know what your next step is, or how confident you should be about your next step it can often be determined by um, by that. And so there's a few questions that you can ask yourself, um, which we kind of have here that sort of assess how, how, how far along the journey is. And we're not gonna like dive really deep into this, like please take a screenshot of this. It's also again in the book. Um, and you know, you can go through this, um, this full sort of thing on, on your own, but 
you know, just to just to kind of zoom out, there's, you know, there's a, there's a number of different factors, really, depending on how much experience you have, and what your existing tech stack looks like. Um, and then, uh, then in terms of like, thinking about, so, so one of the things we talked about a little bit last, uh, uh, last webinar on Tuesday that, you know, we're kind of coming back to here is that every project has risks. Some risks you can mitigate, some risks you can't mitigate. Um, but one of the important things in, in sort of like driving things forward is, is showing to everybody that like you've thought through the possibilities. Not only do you have, you know, the benefits mapped out, which is what we, you know, we talked about in, you know, the, the last part, not only do you know the other sort of key stakeholders that are, you're going to get kind of behind you, which is the first part, but you also know kind of like what could theoretically go wrong and, you know, what the what the weak points are, and you kind of have a plan for that as well. Um, and so, um, you know, often what we see folks doing is uh, if they if they feel like they don't have enough experiences, starting small, building a proof of concept, building a smaller site, um, finding an experienced agency partner, um, and uh, and working and there's a there's a, a company that that actually Neha did a um, a case study uh, on um, on our blog um, called Robinson and Henry that was working with our team um, uh, 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 to basically evaluate whether their agency partner had the chops they needed to sort of successfully complete their project and then as well as like suggest some opt optimization opportunities. Uh, because you know ultimately a lot of it comes down to sort of do you have the 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 experience and the right skill set uh, in house uh, to to go through this successfully. So we want you all to take a quick second and think of the risks that come to mind for projects you're involved in now. Pop it into the chat. Just curious to hear what's going on within your own orgs. And I'll also, uh, Sam, pop in the case study that you just referenced. I think it's a great read for anyone who wants to learn more about what Robinson and Henry actually did. Are all of your organizations risk-free? There has to be something. Another way of thinking about this is like, what are you worried about, right? Like, okay, that's a, that's a, thanks Antonia, not entirely clear about like what um, forms the risks take. So, so some examples could be, um, you know, there's a major stakeholder that you need buy-in from that won't get on board, right? Maybe one option is that what well, one idea is that like, you know, the project slated to take six months, but you know, three months through, uh, there is a big budget change and and it's deprior the project gets deprioritized, right? Maybe something that could happen would be that like, you know, you there's one developer that kind of had all the knowledge in their head about how to make this project work and they you know left for a new job. Um, Maybe the marketing team can't figure out how to use the headless, C, you know, the, a new headless CMS, for example, right? Those are some things that that could go wrong, or they, or maybe they they struggle. Maybe they struggle with the content workflow um, that you, you've kind of set up for them. Um, maybe and, and they're struggling, and so now they, they're getting upset about the new project and the new way of doing things, right? Those are some risks that those are some risks that could come up. In, We've seen oh, 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 we've seen those we've seen some of those come up in the past. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Antonia. Um, some risks in the past have been teaching users how to use the CMS. Yeah. Cool. Well. So what can all of you do within your organizations? And that is, you can perform a risk assessment. Um, it's not something that's super, super uh, complicated. I know it can sound daunting just hearing risk assessment, but essentially what it is, is that you're going to take a moment, you know, maybe spend an hour or two combing through whatever you think are key risks for a project. 
Then once you've done that, you're going to turn to stakeholders within your organization and ask them to almost do the same. Then you, you're all going to come together, whether that's two of you, three of you, 10 of you, whoever the key stakeholders are. And then you're going to try consolidating that list and really start figuring out what are the three to four main things that you need to help mitigate and, you know, brainstorm ways together of how you could potentially do that. Yeah. And it looks like, um, it looks like Roger and, and Lena kind of popped up in the chat. Roger says, um, I think at my company's experiencing situations like those risks, but the project is so established at a hard time because calling it a risk. That's awesome. I mean, that's great news. The risk may have been earlier in the project life cycle, you know, and I guess they got addressed well. Um, and then Lena says, problems with assessing responsibilities and the team considering the migration, right? No, that's a great idea. That's a great point. Like, who has the right skill sets for which thing? And like, do they all get along? And can they all kind of like figure it out together? So yeah, if, you know, and, and if you, if there aren't any risks, if, if you don't feel like there are any risks because they've all been mitigated, I mean, that's the best, that's the best place to be. And if hopefully you're there, but you know, maybe you're not, um, or, or maybe you're thinking of expanding your usage. And so they're going to be new challenges if, you know, with the next stage um, that you could encounter or, or run into. Definitely. And honestly, it's not rocket science. It seems pretty straightforward, and that's because it is. But if you do do this with intentionality as a tech lead, you will be ahead of 80 to 90 percent of your peers. I remember um, I was chatting to Sam when we were putting this together yesterday, and I like laughed. And he's like, why are you laughing? And I'm like, man, this reminds me of like, you know, I know I I want to get healthier. I know I want to get fit and I know what I need to do to get there. I need to work out more. I need to up my protein intake. There's all these things. I have to stop eating out every single day. Yet, it's like how many people are actually going to do that? It's pretty straightforward, but it does take some discipline. And it's the same with this, right? It is going to take a bit of discipline to sit down, really think through the risks and do it with intention and then try to bring a group together that's willing to do the same. Yeah. And, and a couple more interesting comments from the chat here. Antonio says, uh, a big risk is uh, changing from one system to the next. How to convince stakeholders that it's a good move and ask them to trust that it'll be a benefit to change the tech stack. Yeah, that's exactly it. Thanks. Um, and, uh, and, and Roger says, our risks do mostly lie in new challenges as we add more non-text savvy content editors to our website and allowing them to be comfortable without ha someone having to guide them. No, that's that's exactly right. Because as you're getting more stakeholders and more people using the new tech stack, um, you know, if 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 you're successful in onboarding them well, then they're going to be happy and they're going to be advocates. If you're not successful in onboarding them well, they could be detractors and they, they could sort of start building up pressure inside the organization of like, hey, this is weird. We don't like this. Um, cool. Our third takeaway is if you're feeling stuck, that's okay. And Frankly, it's pretty normal, but read case studies for ideas. We have a web page on our website dedicated purely to different types of case studies from various industries, from companies of different sizes, and each one of them highlights someone else. So whether that's an Abigail, an agency owner, whether it's Adam, the architect, or David, the developer enthusiast, you're going to start recognizing these trailblazers within each of our case studies. So I really encourage you to check them out, read them in detail, share them with your team. Another example, and I may be a bit biased, but read Sam's book, Modular, the Web's New Architecture for Ideas. Everything that we've covered today, everything that we covered on Tuesday, it's almost like this gateway to get in the know of Sam's head. You know, he is a co-founder of Gatsby. Everything that went on when establishing this, but also everything that's truly taking place in our space. And last but not least, reach out to chat. We are here to help. If you're not sure how to go about a certain project, how to get buy-in, right? I like to think we're experts at Gatsby um, and the modular web. So reach out, you know, you can reach any of us by email on Twitter, reach out to Sam directly. Um, we also have Gatsby concierge that's there as a white glove um, support service for all of you. If you need even more help um, than just kind of the foundational help um, and we're here to help. Awesome, so let's turn it to all of you 
Q&A, what are you thinking of? What's going through your head? Is there anything that Sam in particular can help answer right now? Let us know. We want to turn the floor over to all of you. So we have a question here right now. What is the most popular community channel for Gatsby? Um, and so we have a Gatsby Discord. Um, and we frequently have members um, from the from the core team uh, that are on that uh, channel answering questions. So if you're sort of like looking for just, I'm going to, hey, I've got a quick thing, like I'm trying to figure out this like thing, uh, it, you can just jump on the, the, the Discord. Um, and if you if you sort of like search for Gatsby Discord, we have links on our um, we have we have links on our site. Um, so so Chris is asking when it's better to use Gatsby and when to use Next. Um, so um, you know Gatsby is there's some Gatsby really excels in specific use cases. So it's great for high performance websites, but you really need to be the fastest possible. And a, a lot of e commerce websites, again like the Eagle types, are really optimize for like well we we know that the the fastest website is going to increase performance and that's going to increase conversions and so we see a number of e-commerce websites going that way and we also see like folks with like complex content use cases they've got a headless cms they've got a lot of structured content inside their headless cms content workflows are important to them a fast preview experience uh fast builds um and and those folks we see um we see a lot of folks with complex content uh, use cases or just you know structured content going with Gatsby headless CMSs. Roger says he actually got his job through the Gatsby Discord. That's awesome, Roger. Thanks for uh, that's that's great to hear. That's that's amazing. Love that. Yeah. yeah, and Roger says Gatsby's data layer is the best one of the best ways to emulate a uh, yeah a, a database um system without actually having one and that's that, that's awesome that's exactly kind of how we designed it um to sort of um aggregate a bunch of your kind of content in, in a structured way um if you hear us talking about Valhalla it's because we want to expose that to the whole web even if you're not using Gatsby because we love the data layer so much um Antonia says she wants to be on this call every day so she can have time to think about all the questions. Well, we actually got a request to do more of these talking about architecture uh, from uh, from some other folks internally. So we might do more. I mean, stay tuned, but we might do more over the next um, few weeks. We'll see. Uh, Antonia is also wondering if we have a recommendation for a particular CMS for smaller e-commerce sites. Um, we see, I mean, yeah, so we see a lot of folks using Contentful for that. We see a lot of folks using Sanity for that. Um, those are pretty good defaults. Um, you know, hard to go, hard to go wrong there. Do we have any more questions? This is the time, folks. We have Sam in front of us ready to help. Uh, and then Federico says, "What's the most recommended um, site to online course from Gatsby?" Uh, there's there's a few of them. Um, um, I'm gonna get his name right, wrong, but um, if you, on LinkedIn Learning, um, Rand Mort Hendrickson has a has a course um, which we like. He's a sort of experienced WordPress community member and um, and has put together a pretty solid course on Gatsby. Um, and that that I, I believe that's free. Um, so it's worth kind of going and checking that out cool. if you're looking for something. We've got a great, I mean, tutorial as well, a multi-part tutorial. Um, so you, that's a great place to start. Um, but if you're looking for something more video-based and longer. We have a question here, Sam. Do you have any integrations to B2B e-com implementations such as Salesforce or SAP Commerce? Uh, yeah, we, we have, um, there's like, some very embryonic stuff there. I, I, my, our recommendation is if you're working with one of the with Salesforce or SAP Commerce, um, what we've what we've heard is that in general, and this is not really specific to Gatsby, but it, it can be a bit trickier. Those systems can be a little bit harder to do headless, and, and you need a little bit more expertise to do it. So we'd actually, if you're working with one of those systems, please use the contact us and reach out to our team because we've seen. We've just seen the systems be a little bit harder to get data out of, and you need a little bit of more handholding with with those kinds of systems. 
So please reach out to your, our team if you're using one of those systems, Idris. Um, is there any blog or channel to share, share the Gatsby team schedule with devs? Like, do you mean like what webinar tree? Do you mean like what webinars we're we're gonna do? Is is that what your question is? Um, if, if that's the question, um, we we don't have a blog or, or channel to share that. Although you can follow our Twitter um, to see when um, to see when we'll announce if we're gonna be doing a webinar, um, and then you know our email list as well. Uh, We'll we announce that a, a few days in advance. We also try to be pretty kind of responsive. So sometimes we might just get an idea from somebody and then want to do it the next week. So we, we you know, we you might not get more than a week's warning because we we will have you know more than a week's warning internally ourselves. Yeah, the biggest thing I can just recommend is um, sign up for our Gatsby Gazette. It's our newsletter that goes out monthly. There's always a section in there that kind of reviews any of the upcoming events that we do know of at that time. Um, so would 100% recommend checking out our newsletter. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it looks like we're questions are sort of like uh, dying down a little bit. Um, so I mean, we can have a, a few more seconds in case anybody has a, um, has a, has a question that they want to pop in the chat. But I think, you know, generally, like, thanks, thanks, everybody for coming. Thanks for spending your, your time here with us, at, you know, in the, in this virtual webinar. And it's great to, it's great to hear what everybody's doing, what everybody's working on, the progress everybody's making, the things that they're thinking about, and, and having everybody share their experiences with each other, right, um, as part of the Gatsby community. So thanks to everyone for coming. Um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, uh yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we're, we're grateful to have you guys here and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Um, we'll, we'll let you know as soon as we have another one uh, planned and uh, uh, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, and uh, until the next time. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.